Hello, I'm Nathaniel Osgood. Um, I'm uh, going to be presenting here a first glimpse at the Computational Epidemiology Public Health Informatics Lab's COVID-19 particle filtering models, um, uh, where Cephal is based at University of Saskatchewan. But this work uh, does reflect um, a joint effort with the Saskatchewan Health Authority. And I'd like to uh, provide my most uh, sincere gratitude to uh, uh, Jenny Bazran, um, to uh, the many students who have who have assisted this project, and to Maureen Anderson with for um, epidemiological uh, assistance, and to the many others who have helped make this uh, work uh, possible. Um, the program of work um, conducted by Cephal um, uh, jointly with. Uh, uh, with the Saskatchewan Health Authority is really designed to uh, provide public health and acute care planning and ongoing strategic guidance um, and operational guidance uh, soon to the Saskatchewan Health Authority and the chief medical officer of the uh, province. Um, it does involve uh, dynamic and hybrid modeling um, uh, as well as uh, a program in involving um, social media mining and analysis. And soon we'll be having uh, studies uh, in the field um, which involve smartphone-based uh, data collection. I'm going to be uh, zooming down to that second item here, the dynamic and, and hybrid modeling. Um, uh, this is work that, uh, that cross-links uh, some of the other work uh, just noted um, in terms of data mining and analysis but focuses on the modeling components. And there's really five different areas of work on the dynamic modeling front that have uh, each achieved a fair bit of maturity um, uh, within the, the past two months we've been working on them. Uh, the first, um, uh, to get us started um, and to provide a, a sort of a broad brush understanding of, of um, uh, where we might best intervene and, and, um, and when, uh, our aggregate compartmental or system dynamics models. Um, these are models that uh, for us have involved uh, characterization of the uh, typical uh, symptomatic uh, pathways um, in natural history of infection, as well as the oligosymptomatic or, or persistent asymptomatic pathways. Uh, they do involve uh, articulated characterizations of complications, of um, some characterization of, of screening and contact tracing, as much as that can be done uh, um, comfortably within the uh, compartmental uh, framework, and uh, acuity and as well as service stratified hospitalization and acute care progression. So distinguishing people by, um, uh, for example, whether they require uh, critical or severe um, care as characterized by uh, WHO standards, and um, whether they need invasive, uh, non-invasive, um, uh, or, or other, for example, oxygen support whilst in hospital. Um, these models um, have been a bit like a booster rocket, have, have gotten us to a very high altitude, allowed us to uh, uh, contribute uh, some uh, rough estimates to capacity planning in our acute care and public health areas. Um, but to really examine, um, uh, they're somewhat blunt instruments. And, and you know, really, uh, as anyone who's done large amounts of compartmental um, uh, aggregate modeling as well as uh, individual modeling, uh, can relate to, um, they really run into challenges when, when trying to understand in detail how to intervene and um, uh, how to implement those interventions. Um, um, really, we, we need um, uh, more uh, fine-grained instruments when we're reasoning uh, about design of many interventions. And for this reason, agent-based models um, uh, our, our uh, second uh, large set of tools. Uh, we have two rich um, agent-based models, including a, a richly empirically grounded uh, GIS model that includes really fine-grained characterization of key public health interventions and a growing number of, of uh, additional components. Over time, this involves uh, community cohorting, uh, contact tracing, uh, screening, uh, at different levels, long-term care facility uh, characterization and school workplace closure, um, as well as some ability to characterize healthcare worker and nosocomial infection transmission. Um, we also have uh, an agent-based model that's more behaviorally oriented, which includes um, uh, representation of uh, uh, even things like uh, uh, purchasing uh, behavior, uh, panic buying, um, 
uh, things that might be relevant when considering about interventions towards social distancing that that work, for example, to, to limit contact when uh, shopping in the community. Um, uh, it also has an admirable capacity to represent quarantine, uh, testing, and has been used to, to really understand the impacts of uh, uh, contact tracking apps, such as uh, uh, now being offered by our Ethica app, and uh, not for research use, but for um, health system deployment use for uh, privacy preserving um, uh, capacity to, to track contacts with where at point of contact tracing, there could be a, a, a richer and uh, efficiency generating and more complete set of uh, contacts generated while ensuring the privacy of all involved. Um, beyond those agent-based models, we also have an extraordinary uh, uh, model led by uh, my student Yuan Tian, um, which uh, provides sort of a scalable characterization of transmission and in um, catchment basins together with uh, a very detailed acute care characterization. This is a hybrid model that, that uses a hybrid of, of compartmental or system dynamics characterization for elements of the low risk population, agent-based characterization for high risk individuals and discrete event simulation uh, in facility at a very detailed level of, of acute care flows. Um, from um, uh, emergency room contact to um, uh, various hospital wards to um, uh, ALC or alternative levels of care um, considerations before discharge into the community. Um, issues which achieve uh, added texture within the context of um, um, capacity planning for, uh, for uh, the COVID context. Uh, where we also have to deal with uh, nosocomial infection transmission and and transmission to uh, excuse me and, and discharge to facilities that uh, can isolate individuals um, who may otherwise represent um, agents in this um, very novel uh, model uh, individuate um, they become agents uh, when they become high risk um, and are followed as agents but the lower risk population is is characterized using a compartmental model this affords us a great uh, economy of, of uh, computation whilst uh, providing us that extra level of resolution that's really really necessary um, to to resolve a finer grain intervention um, intervention questions um, uh, the final set of models on which we're uh, focusing in this uh, brief uh, uh, glimpse uh, are, are models that combine um, machine learning techniques on the one hand with uh, dynamic modeling. And uh, we pursue two lines of work here, um, inspired by our joint work with uh, Dr. Jusun Liu um, and much of this uh, taking, um, taking flight because of the, uh, the guidance that she's offered over the years. These include uh, particle filtering models um, uh, at different levels. We're going to be focusing on, on aggregate models uh, here, as well as uh, particle MCMC models, which are much more sophisticated yet and which will be the subject of um, some uh, later presentations, where some uh, really uh, uh, path-breaking work is being done with particle filtering individual-based um, uh, models, uh, a framework for that uh, by my student, Leah Lamp. I should acknowledge um, the extraordinary work of Yuan Tian um, on the second to last point of uh, Winchell uh, Chen and uh, Yang Chin on this intervention, uh, excuse me, on the behavioral oriented modeling and Wade uh, McDonald on the empirically rich intervention oriented modeling, uh, as well as the other students such as Xiao Yan Li, who have helped out with the, the particle filtering and Xiao Yan and, and uh, Lu Jie Duan um, with the uh, particle MCMC, as well as the, the other students who have done so much work to uh, enable data collection in the background. So the exemplar context uh, for much of this work is, is outbreak prediction in response planning for um, the uh, um, COVID-19 context. And um, this work is, is motivated by the fact that mobilization um, and indeed planning for healthcare resources hinge on outbreak detection and anticipation of, of, of how heavy the burden would be, how quickly it will present, and, and anticipation of its evolution. Um, and uh, whilst traditional reporting gives some sense of where we're at, it, it often gives little clarity for what lies ahead, particularly given changing intervention regimes, etc. Um, the goal here is really early detection and anticipating the trajectory of incident cases. Um, 
uh, for this uh, this particle filtering work um, and allowing us to uh, to better understand where we're at in a way that will translate to better intervention planning. Um, uh, it's a more grounded understanding of the trade-offs likely to obtain between different interventions. Um, and uh, this is in the context of, of outbreaks, which are marked by uh, shifts in intervention regime, but also notable stochastics um, that, that really uh, thwart uh, static uh, recommendation as to certain policies um, uh, that uh, remain invariant. Instead, you need an adaptive, uh, uh, adaptive strategy. Where these needs are particularly acute in the anticipated dance phase, I'm, I'm pointing to, uh, uh, to the, of course, the article Hammer in the Dance um, by uh, Thomas uh, Poyo, um, uh, who, who speaks about the, um, um, the growing need to, to reason about um, this sort of adaptive response to um, uh, outbreak suppression um, uh, following the relaxation of large-scale social distancing. Um, now, the challenges for, for many dynamic models in this context is traditionally we build the model and then we use it for insight. And building the model is often a very heavyweight process which involves grounding the model in data through processes such as parameterization and, and calibration um, and, and testing it through cost validation and otherwise uh, tests such as extreme value testing, dimensionality testing, et cetera. Um, but then we use it for insight. And, and these processes tend to tend to fall somewhat quite flat in the context of a, a very rapidly evolving um, uh, epidemiological and intervention context. Um, often with, with these traditional mechanisms, realigning the model with new data is a heavyweight manual process that it's hard to do, uh, you know, once a month, much less every day, um, reparameterizing it, recalibrating it, doing cross validation, et cetera. Um, uh, and, uh, Traditional calibration can aid in this, but it's frankly a fairly weak technique, as um, and 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 a technique that's that's quite limited uh, in its ability to deal with a changing underlying context, because the um, there's a failure to update our understanding of model state at later times to reflect what's actually been observed till now. Um, it's a bit like dealing with a weather model that was created two weeks ago, and uh, and you're trying to tune it for what's been observed till now by tuning its parameters, um, where really what you want to do is tell it, hey, look, this is the state as we've seen it right now, as we best understand it. What do you anticipate going forward? Um, there's another reflection, too, that, look, even the best of models or approximation, even the most detailed, most refined, most evidence-grounded uh, models, they eventually diverge from empirical situation as time passes. Some of this is changing um, uh, intervention regime, changing behavior. Um, in other cases, it's factors that for all intents and purposes have to be treated as stochastic. Here in Saskatchewan, we've probably benefited uh, significantly from um, colder weather patterns and encouraging social distancing. And there's no way realistically that, that an intervention-oriented model is gonna be able to anticipate this. And, and you need to model, to reground model state to reflect how those stochastics have played out, to reflect the card of hands you've actually been dealt over time uh, about the outbreak, by the changing um, uh, vagaries of public adherence to social distancing and attitudes, um, changes in, in weather patterns, and um, evolution of, of a fast-changing bug. <coughs> So the goals of this work reflect our, our general commitment to increasingly render models from discrete products that are you know, built and, um, and then subsequently used for insight as, as sort of static and variant quantities. And to instead have them daily refreshed, daily regrounded, um, daily learning, um, where every day we estimate latent state of the model, the underlying situation that's represented by the model, um, we, we reground it, what's at, actually the weather today as it's been observed, so that when we look forward, we can, we can do so from that basis, as it were. Um, and then we can use that to project forward over days or weeks. But we also use this regrounding and latent state um, in, in the full state of the system right now to evaluate what-if scenarios for public health and acute care needs going forward. Um, 
uh, recognizing that those the outcomes of the what-if scenarios, which intervention is more desirable by another, may depend very heavily on um, the, the learning that's gone on for what the latent state is today. If, if um, the latent state is pointing to a very large number of, of uh, oligosymptomatics or, or persistent asymptomatics, for example, um, that might point to a, a curve that's going to flatten out soon. And um, what if scenarios that um, can take advantage of that will be more favorable in terms of intervention design? By contrast, if you're you're finding evidence of um, uh, adversely waning um, commitments to social distancing and low levels of oligosymptomatics, um, it may be that a, a different intervention regime is advised. And, and so our estimation, our regrounding what's actually observed often very materially influences, sometimes um, and profoundly shapes uh, our understanding of, of what interventions are most desirable. So we're seeking here, to tap that analogy I've been uh, using, uh, something akin to, a, to, to the common expectation for weather apps and, and, and weather reports, right? Um, we may be using a model for for weather that was um, was crafted uh, many years ago, uh, you know, three four years ago perhaps, um, or six months ago. But but we need that model to keep current. We need the model to be reflected to update the latest situation. Um, it can't predict all the vagaries of how a thunderstorm will pass here on the prairies. Um, nor is it going to be able to to anticipate the Chinooks that sweep down the the Rocky Mountains into Alberta. Um, it's not going to be able to anticipate uh, the exact levels of precipitation. But given what has been observed, we want to. We always want to look forward to tomorrow, um, using that model, but that regrounded model. Um, we want a model that learns over time, and that learns about contact patterns and the fraction of oligosymptomatics and the fraction of people that are seeking care, etc and can anticipate going forward in light of that learning. Um, sometimes they may give us a tighter distribution going forward, the anticipation of an outbreak in the near future, or sometimes looser. Um, and, you know, I, I had noted, like a GPS, uh, depending on where we're at, it, it might change its recommendation for what's best to get us to where we want to get to, because where we are now might have a very material impact on what we need to do to, to get to that desirable health state, that desirable cost state, that desirable sustainability state for our acute care system in light of a coming COVID tidal wave. <clears throat> now, there's um, many ways to, to accomplish this. And, uh, you know, in decades past, in the middle of the, the 20th century, um, a uh, very high performance um, method of Kalman filtering was created to, to allow for, for dealing with this estimation um, uh, problem. Uh, that's a, a method very well suited to um, things which need, need real-time updates um, at the level of, of milliseconds, for example. Um, systems such as rockets or, or, or potentially um, uh, aircraft. Um, but uh, it's um, got very, very tight distributional assumptions, very tight limitations over what sort of models it can be used with. Um, and uh, using an MLE estimate, it, it really falls prey to, to uh, huge mistakes in, in nonlinear models, such as are common in infection transmission. So in my view, um, common filtering is a very weak method for what we need uh, to address the challenges of COVID and indeed most communicable diseases. Um, uh, within this sphere, we've, we've turned to uh, much stronger techniques, techniques that have arisen out of the uh, computational statistics sphere, sphere, which combine machine learning and dynamic models. Our early, early um, explorations uh, led us to particle MCMC, uh, excuse me, to MCMC. Um, um, uh, all this joint work with uh, Dr. Julian Liu of our uh, uh, math and stats and, and absolutely extraordinary computational statistician. Um, uh, subsequently, we've uh, put a lot of emphasis on particle filtering or a type of sequential Monte Carlo method and a great deal on particle MCMC, which would be the 
uh, power, more powerful love uh, model uh, approach yet, which will be the subject of uh, later expositions. Um, uh, and in the particle uh, filtering context, what we're sampling from is given a set of parameter values um, in a given model, we're, we're sampling from the full state of the system in light of um, observed data Y. Um, so the full state of the system over time, the trajectories within the system are things we sample from in light of um, the observed data. Um, and as we see, we'll, we'll do so uh, recursively. Um, so we're, we're computing the posteriors of these, um, um, these trajectories these, in these latent states uh, in light of unfolding observations over time. And this is a strategy with, uh, uh, with a great deal of enablement from Dr. Liu and collaboration with many other parties. We've applied very successfully to many areas um, to very good, good effect. Um, and I should note the work that I'm um, laying forth here is one where we're uh, delighted to recently be joining forces with uh, uh, Dr. Alex Doroshenko of uh, Alberta Health Services and and University of Alberta for um, uh, for application within Alberta to very good effect. Our models are showing very good results uh, using um, uh, uh, using using data on COVID. Okay, um, a few key facts about how particle filtering works before we jump into the to the model, and I'll be giving you a kind of live tour. Um, so the simulation models within the particle filtering context invariably include stochastic processes. It doesn't make sense to apply it to a purely deterministic model. Um, and, and there's a back and forth between two phases. There's a, a, a prediction step where the model runs for each particle, each of, of the samples being simulated um, in a typical fashion. And at observations, the, the state is corrected in a form um, uh, to align with empirical data after an observation. Um, and uh, this whole process is performed recursively. And it's in an, to use the terminology from, um, that we'll find in um, computational circles, it's an online algorithm. So as new data comes in, it updates its estimates without needing to, to go back and consider all earlier data. It, it sort of incrementally updates its, its estimate of state in light of new observations, unfolding uncertainty over time as new data comes in. Um, and we update those estimates and can project forward. Um, now, it estimates the underlying state um, of the system at any one time through a sampling method based on sequential importance sampling. And each sample is termed a particle here, and it's importance weighted with a weight that, it, to some degree, if one could th if one could be excused for, for for referring to it as kind of the credibility of of that part. I'd like to think of the particles as representing different hypotheses for what's going on right now in the model, and a given part particle has has a given understanding that it thinks you know there's this many susceptibles, there's that many exposed individuals infected but not yet infective there's this many individuals in the first stage of their infectivity in an asymptomatic phase there's this many in the in in a symptomatic phase or a uh, oligosymptomatic phase etc and another particle would disagree with that and have a different hypothesis for what the state is and these particles they there's a survival fittest they jockey to explain the data and their weights reflect their sort of credibility or their their um, consistency that's been observed with the data. Um, and these competing hypotheses compete to explain things. And those that are more consistent with the empirical data flourish, they multiply. Um, and uh, those that are inconsistent, are consistently inconsistent with the data, are, uh, fly at odds with the data, um, anticipate things that simply don't square with the data. Uh, they tend to die out. Um, so the ones that are consistent are fruitful and multiply. Um, and um, it tends to, to weed out hypotheses for what's going on now that are, that are inconsistent. Um, I'm not going to dwell on this slide, but uh, performing particle filter on an aggregate model does involve 
subscripting the model by thousands of particles. Um, we commonly run this model with 20,000, 30,000, sometimes 50,000 particles. These competing jockeying uh, hypotheses that compete to explain the situation and have a survival of the fittest. And there's this back and forth between observations that the standard model dynamics apply, um, excuse me, between observations where you're up going um, to the next point of the next observation, then up observations where the each particle is has its weight updated to reflect how how well it's it's stacked up against what was observed, how well it's its prediction squared with what was actually empirically observed. And there's a resampling phase which involves weeding out particles to enhance effective sample size, weeding out particles that are inconsistent with the with the data and to sample trajectories, you can do that through the ancestry matrix, although I won't be discussing that here. Um, so within our context, our particle filtering models um, uh, discussed here, our aggregate ones, are based on our compartmental SD models. Um, they uh, uh, do include uh, a representation of, um, uh, of sort of a characterization of uh, common natural history of infection, uh, this oligosymptomatic or persistent asymptomatic uh, pathway, representations of incoming individuals who are who bring an infection following international travel, um, uh, as well as non-travel cases. That's really needed for historic data early on because of the preponderance of individuals bringing back uh, infection from other jurisdictions. Um, to, to really robustly interpret the data, you need to understand that there's all these infected individuals arriving from outside who are not endogenously produced. Um, and uh, we have a representation of the hospital um, uh, flows um, and uh, discharge from the hospital of death, of, of um, progression of individuals uh, subject to complications and development of complications um, and mortality um, and uh, diagnosis of an individual um, and, and lack thereof, including in both the oligosymptomatic and the the more uh, uh, tip, uh, the more uh, familiar uh, natural history of infection. There are several versions of this model, uh, age structured, uh, aggregate, non-age structured, uh, those that, that have more articulated uh, characterization of asymptomatics with differential uh, transmittivity, and, um, and those layering a probabilistic testing model that has turned out to be of a, a, a great value in interpreting the data. And we've um, run scenarios uh, successfully for, for Canada as a whole, for Saskatchewan, for the U.S., for Alberta, and, and done some work with uh, uh, Italy as well. The Alberta, again, with Alex Doroshenko at U of A and, at, uh, and, and jointly at Alberta Health Services. Um, so um, I noted this uh, key separation travel from non-travel cases, key for matching up the data, incorporation of this testing module where we have testing data from different jurisdictions coming in and test positivity, um, number of positive tests, um, and a representation of the testing process in the model. Um, we have parameter uncertainty for evolving dynamic parameters with respect to contact. Um, in, in, in contact levels, reflective of a changing intervention context, which very materially shapes contact patterns and contact rates um, through social distancing. Um, uh, with respect to uncertainty with respect to presentation, how many individuals will seek care given symptoms, for example, and uh, testing related parameters uh, that, that relate to this testing model, um, given how many tests, uh, how, how many infectives, do we, do we find out there in the population? Um, so uh, the, uh, the current status of this uh, model is, is uh, it, it lends very good matches uh, of the behavior of the model to reliable data. It regrounds um, the model with the data, but, but really um, admirably matches uh, the data that's reliable. We have some data on recoveries that's turned out to be really uh, problematic, and and I understand that this these problems are are not limited to our jurisdiction about not not recording, for example, recovered individuals reliably. So we haven't placed uh, 
any serious emphasis on matching that. It, our model does successfully detect shifts in epidemiology, as we'll see, for example, uh, shifts to lower contact patterns, capacity to detect uh, effects of interventions, um, uh, for example, in those contact patterns, um, uh, capacity to estimate the, the current state, including the latent state of the system, you know, concerning uh, oligosymptomatics, undiagnosed individuals, the capacity to project forward without rapid growth and uncertainty uh, on the order of days a week or a week. Um, uh, we haven't looked so far much beyond that. And uh, support for examination, a really good platform to examine effects of interventions. <coughs> Excuse me. And what this model really gives us for its ability to estimate latent state is kind of a tomographic view of the population. It puts together data, you know, from a um, uh, number of new cases and cumulative cases and number of deaths and, um, and testing data um, and soon additional data as well um, to, to provide a sort of a three-dimensional view of what's going on there in the population. Um, just as a tomography machine, a computer tomography machine will take images from many different angles, each of which is has limited field of view, is occluded by by obstructions such as uh, bones or or, or um, plates and um, uh, in a in a person's body, um, uh, and each of which is terribly limited, but which and only deals with a slice, but which collectively they can be knitted together into a three D view. That's really what particle filtering does within these models. And we'll get a bit of a of a glimpse of this. So what I'm going to do is is switch over uh, appropriately enough to our um, to our particle filtering model, and maybe I'll just show it in action. So a particle filtering model provides uh, incoming data, um, and um, uh, this data is as it's unfolding, um, the model uh, regrounds itself and, and recorrects itself. Um, uh, this is an example of incoming data. Here's another example. This data has not been provided to the model in this case, and we don't think it's reliable. It's recovery-related data, so I'm not going to talk about it. But you'll notice that the model over time is giving a distribution. This is the, the reflective of the, the state distribution um, that it holds across all the different particles. Remember, we estimate that underlying state using sampling. We have these particles that represent different hypotheses and which have different weights, and we sample according to their weights and that induces a distribution over you know how many people we might expect to see at this time or at this time and how might that play out going forward after the time where empirical data are available um so this is like running the model on a on a distribution where that distribution is regrounded regularly um and we can estimate aspects of latent state that are otherwise hard to estimate for example aspects of the effective reproductive number which in this case you see plummeting here after the announcing of of provincial um restrictions on um on uh you know on gatherings and uh requesting that people stay at home you see the effective reproductive rate uh dropping uh, dramatically but prior to that if you can see this a uh, density plot and there was a growing amount to which of, of, of high rates of growth. And this reflects is reflected in the, the cases here, really rising here during this phase as um, it was light, likely spreading in the underlying population. But then with this uh, intervention regime, really the effective reproductive number um, uh, associated with the number of infections caused by a single infective before they recover dropping uh, quite precipitously here um, over the span of, of, of weeks to a level that's um, now uh, places it uh, below um, below one. Um, uh, and you could see the model's estimate of what was going on in the underlying population lent it first to think there'd be a faster trajectory, but seeing what was going on in, in cases and in deaths, it, um, it recorrected. And then again, it thought it might be growing, but those hypotheses didn't square with the data, and so it brought them back down to Earth. And, you know, this is an estimate of how many undiagnosed infectives it thinks are out there in the population, lying right now somewhere between 300 and 400 or so. Um, well, actually, and this is in the 
projection regime. So it's probably somewhere just short of uh, 400 here, or about 350 or so. Um, and uh, it's also allowing us to estimate the probability per day people are seeking care, given that there are many individuals who we don't know about being infected, who are not reported cases, but are indeed infective. They're, they're infected individuals. How many of these people actually seek care? So to what degree are we seeking, seeing just a, a tip of the iceberg, you know, uh, just 10% of a much larger mass of people are infective. To what degree are we seeing a, a larger number? And here it's, it has trouble figuring out early on, but now it's getting real signal. And it thinks, okay, between about 30 to 40% of people ultimately um, uh, present. So a model like this, in short, can estimate underlying state. Uh, it can estimate dynamically changing parameters over time on the basis of unfolding data. Unfolding data, for example, about uh, cases or about deaths. Um, later, as we get better recovery data, maybe we'll be able to tap into that. But right now, we don't view it as reliable uh, for this jurisdiction, for, for our home province of Saskatchewan. Um, but as new data comes in, it is regrounding its understanding. And you can see evidence that here about what's likely to play out in future weeks. So how is all this based on a model? Well, here's the underlying model. And I apologize for the, uh, um, uh, for the, uh, for the shock of, of, of seeing it in all its aesthetic uh, disarray. Um, the aesthetic uh, disarray um, um, is made up for tight logical consistency and rigor. Um, Individuals here progress through a series of stages associated with natural history of infection from a susceptible state to an exposed state where they're infected but not yet infective um, to a state associated with um, um, asymptomatic early stage infectivity. Now, um, at, at, uh, as, as they progress, they can either... Uh, develop along a persistent asymptomatic pathway, an oligosymptomatic pathway, where they never develop serious symptoms, or they can go on to a, a first-stage symptomatic state. Um, and there's varying evidence about how many go each way, and we routinely conduct experiments which posit uh, very different burdens going, or di very different fractions going, going these different ways, to, amongst other things, to test robustness of our inferences. And and um, in other contexts to test robustness of our intervention strategies. So individuals along the normal pathway would progress along a stage of, of early stage symptomatic and then late stage symptomatic, um, uh, from which um, early stage they might uh, develop in a way that develops complications with an average delay time about six days for that, otherwise going on to a state post risk of complications um, once they uh, recover uh, after some um, remaining time infective. Um, now, at any stage uh, along this pathway, they can get diagnosed. Um, and this diagnosis can take place in the symptomatic stages through uh, um, active presentation for care or uh, shown in purple. Um, where is that? Fuchsia. Um, my aesthetic sense uh, is... Uh, is limited. Um, uh, uh, maybe it's magenta. Um, they um, at any stage with the magenta, they can become uh, they can become diagnosed uh, through active screening. Um, active screening, uh, for example, with uh, uh, a large scale screening, or or indeed they can be caught with contact tracing, and uh, this can occur as well along the oligosymptomatic pathways above. Um, Eventually, people can recover. Some recover in a diagnosed state where their state was recognized prior to recovery. Others, others recover in, an, um, uh, in a state that remained undiagnosed and uh, where they're not counted in the case counts. Um, a model such as this has this underlying state, but it's also accumulating statistics that we can bear with real-world data, such as the number of community-identified cases, or uh, cases arriving from outside. And indeed, the model has a fairly articulated representation of arriving individuals because of their 
very uh, large bearing on particularly early numbers um, of, of uh, individuals who are identified as being COVID positive. Um, uh, it's not the purpose with of this talk. You'll find a number of other talks on particle filtering um, in which I uh, uh, expound upon the, uh, the uh, implementation of particle filtering models, but I will note that um, uh, per our implementation pattern within uh, any logic uh, here, this package I'm using, um, all these compartments or stocks are subscripted by particle. And so um, those particles, you may recall, reflect different hypotheses. And they're, they're all running in the model in parallel between observations. Um, so uh, we might have 30,000 jockeying hypotheses um, competing in terms of fitness as judged by consistency of the data that are running and progressing through here. And at time of an observation, what this model what this model state suggests for a given particle will be considered, we'll judge it against the uh, observed data, and um, we'll see how well the predictions of that model measure up. And based on that, we'll update its weight. And uh, by so updating, um, we uh, essentially update our estimate of the state because the weight is used with important sampling to shape the the underlying distribution which um, which applies and so we're running this thing with a with an underlying distribution and and you saw that earlier and periodically in a resampling step we select and multiply the particles that have higher weights and we we uh, eliminate the particles with uh, it tends to eliminate the particles with low weights there's a survival of the fittest and those with low weights die out, and those are with high weights are fruitful, and they multiply. And then they diverge because of stochastics. But that, ladies and gentlemen, is the subject of more technical talks. So I provided you here with, with just a glimpse of our particle filtering for particle filtering models. Um, uh, this particle filtering uh, secures enormous promise. It, it turns models from being discrete products into services that are constantly updated with new data, which provide fresh anticipation of what's coming, anticipate the current state, including the latent state, areas of the state we'd love to know, um, but where the, the data we directly observe doesn't directly tell us what to expect. The model puts it together in the model logic to tell us how many asymptomatics there might be, how many undiagnosed symptomatics or, or, or early stage uh, asymptomatics, puts it all together um, from the evidence, gives us this, this holographic uh, view to which I referred earlier. Um, uh, this, this sort of model can then be used to examine interventions in light of this data we've estimated, this underlying state, what would be the impact of different intervention strategies? And will give us a probabilistic estimate of this. And I'll be showing that in future slides. Um, but in many ways, um, uh, these models are meeting our, our goals. They're meeting our goals to project forward, to be able to estimate the underlying state and to provide that key, that key link to evaluate intervention outcomes. Um, which f forms the basis of so much of uh, our work with the Saskatchewan Health Authority um, work that I'm, I'm honored to be pursuing with Dr. Jenny Basran, um, our team of, of students, with help by uh, Maureen Anderson and others within the, uh, the, the Health Authority. It's been my honor today to be able to prevent a first glimpse of these rapidly evolving models to you. Uh, I hope this has given you some sense of um, the work that's going on, the promises of these models for lending us actionable insight, for helping us understand the effects and non-effects of our interventions, areas where our interventions fall short, and how we can secure interventions that are more robust, depending not just on, on what we posit in the model, but, but unfolding data of many sorts so it'll give us a consensus picture of what's likely to come 
and what interventions are likely to have the greatest effect. Thank you very much, uh, and uh, I hope this information has been of help. It's been an honor to be able to convey it to you. Thank you.